G'day folks, welcome back from your mid-semester break and to the second half of the optics subunit of, of, uh, of this great unit. We're going to continue where we left off with figuring out how Gaussian beams propagate. And this is particularly relevant since we last spoke, since the Nobel Prize in Physics for this year has been awarded uh, for optical tweezers. And if you hadn't already guessed, Gaussian beams and Gaussian optics are at the absolute core of optical tweezers, where you can control particles of matter using the wavefronts of light. And what does that is the focus of the Gaussian beam. And um, we predict uh, all the things you need to know to make an optical tweezer, which you'll get to do in third year physics uh, when you stick around next year to do our great laboratory program. <clears throat> First, uh, a recap of where we left off. And you'll notice today I'm wearing my NASA jumper. Um, yes, it's from ASOS. No, it's not ironic. Uh, it's because I'm celebrating NASA today for a couple of reasons. We left off with this suitcase of mirrors, which reflects a very small number of photons back to us, 100 for every 10 to the 18 we send up there, which tells us heaps about the, um, the Earth-Moon distance and a lot about the Moon. Thanks, IKEA, for providing these great retroreflectors. What did we learn? We learned um, the Earth-Moon distance to about a millimeter these days. Started off about a meter or so. Now we can get it down to about a millimeter. Uh, this told us about the equivalence principle. We're using our nearest neighbor to test Einstein's equivalence principle, which is really cool. By looking at the small wobble of the uh, moon's motion as well, we can rule out lots of different types of structure of the moon and actually figure out what it's composed of right down to its core. So this kind of um, structural, radial structure of the moon is determined from these ra range finding measurements where you can um, really see how the motion of the moon changes throughout a lunar cycle. And it also reminds me that the moon has a, um, a liquid core like a Cadbury cream egg. I know what you're thinking, and that is, we didn't really land on the moon. This is all fake. And if you've watched these two movies, which I can recommend, um, which are kind of modern, trope, modern riffs on the trope of Stanley Kubrick's um, fake moon landing, you'll think that this is all just a hoax, right? So um, if the 100 photons coming back from 10 to the 18 we sent up weren't enough for t to convince you, there is other data. It's in the form of measurements from this device, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which got sent up in 2009 and is still orbiting the moon at a height of some tens of kilometers today. On board is this amazing high numerical aperture camera. Uh, shown here for scale is a hammer and a, a Stanley knife, not how this was made. And a wide angle kind of, you know, not much bigger than your smartphone, wide angle camera um, taking images of the moon, of the lunar surface. How good does it do? Well, let's take a look. It basically gives us this amazing um, Google Earth for the moon, pretty much, right? Um, this, this is a real composition of, of these images. And you can zoom in, you know, all the way down to, if you look at the uh, bottom left of screen here, you'll see that at the moment I've got about 500 meters per pixel. Um, and I can go all the way in to some insane detail. Let's just find some crater that's, that looks pretty interesting. And, um, and go all the way into kind of about half a meter per pixel, which is just insane. And I've just picked some random, random spot because I can't actually um, uh, find what I want to show you with the new search um, feature of this website. But I encourage you to take a look at this. Uh, it's an incredible composition of images. They're updated um, you know, every couple of years. The mission was only supposed to last a few years, but it's still going and may go for several years more. What has it told us about the, um, the things we left on the moon? Well, here's a picture of um, the Apollo 11 landing site taken from this device less than a year after it was put into orbit. Um, what's, if you haven't seen this image before, what are some things up here that kind of, uh, what are these spaghetti type things on the, on the moon surface? Yeah, they're trails, right? They look like snail trails. They are literally just um, tracks of where um, the rover did some, um, some circle work. Actually, of course, there was no rover, exactly, some burnouts. There was no rover on Apollo 11. This is actually Apollo 15. Um, Apollo 15 took a car up and they, they did some burnouts. Um, and this dot right here is the lunar range-finding retroreflector, the suitcase of mirrors. So you don't need to believe me and look at these abstract measurements of photons coming back. You can literally look at photographs of all the stuff we left up on the moon. You know, space junk, uh, the rover, 
um, astronauts, defecation, everything you want is up there for you to see on the moon. And there are some incredible images of stuff left up there. Um, in fact, there's several images of all sorts of things, including these various landing sites of where we put retro reflectors, not just from Apollo 11 and Apollo 15. One that's particularly uh, interesting to me is Lunokhod 1. This was the very first wheeled vehicle we put on a celestial body. It was taken up to the moon in 1970, and it was supposed to last about uh, 90 days. It roved over the moon for about 330 days, and it was controlled by um, some uh, Russians who were given this task to move this vehicle with joysticks with a four-second delay at a speed of 0.1 kilometers an hour. <laughs> they were called the Sedentary Cosmonauts, which, if any of you are looking for a band name, I highly recommend that one. <laughs> but after 330 days, um, and it has a lunar, retro, lunar range-finding retroreflector on its back, they lost it. It went missing. And literally for 40 years, uh, this thing was just in the middle of nowhere. We couldn't find it. Until someone took a very close look at these um, LROC images and found this one. So this one was taken in 2009 as well. And again, you'll see something striking about this image. What is it? There's a shiny thing at the top. There's lots of shiny things. That could just be a kind of camera artifact. What's the other smoking gun here that something's... Yeah, there's some more trails, right? So the sedentary cosmonauts are doing burnouts too. And they've done a massive burnout from here all the way out to here. And this is a smoking gun that this is indeed the missing Lunokhod 1 that was literally missing for 40 years. Um, in 2011, this image was updated. So we've taken a much uh, better image now. And I'm going to zoom into this now. And you can see that um, there's just this incredible shot of this kind of uh, car-sized vehicle on the moon. It was this type of image that allowed um, American uh, scientists to train their lasers onto this rangefinder and actually send light up and get it back again for the first time uh, in 40 years. And in 2011, I think that was, they realized that um, all the range-finding retroreflectors are a bit dusty these days and their reflect reflectance is quite low. But actually, this one is one of the best of the bunch. So it was missing for a while and it's been a huge boon to find it because it's sending back um, heaps more photons than the other ones um, uh, are doing currently. It's very cool. It also, um, those range finding measurements helped us figure out the landing place of Lunokhod 1 to within five meters, which is uh, maybe even 50 centimeters, which is pretty amazing. When LROC turns around and does a selfie of us, this is what we see, a black and white image of Earth. Uh, this was taken about a year ago today, just after the uh, eclipse, and that is the shadow <laughs> of the eclipse on the Earth. That's the eclipse, um, the totality passing over Earth's surface uh, during the eclipse, taken by Elrock. So that's um, a nice aside to, um, into the Apollo missions to prove to you that they're true, and also to remind you um, what Gaussian beams and lunar range finding retroreflection has told us about our nearest neighbor and the stuff we left up there. Let's get back to our regular programming. Um, last time we looked at these um, Gaussian trial solutions. We, we had this complicated equation for uh, wave fields in the praxial approximation, and we had a crack at solving it by putting in a particular t type of, of equation. We didn't know what P was, we didn't know what Q was, but we had some physical grounds for saying this is what a, um, a solution might look like, a spherical wave parameterized in this way, and, um, and let's go ahead and find out what the consequences are. And, um, we substituted this into the praxial equation and found uh, two new equations, much simpler one-dimensional differential equations for these unknown P's and Q's. And, you know, I went through this um, derivation. It took about sort of 15 minutes to get through uh, quite a long derivation of, uh, of substituting that trial solution in. I'm not going to dwell on that today. Instead, I want to show you um, how much easier it is to do in Mathematica. Um, I probably don't need to convince you at this point of the year, but um, I'm going to anyway. So please start your watches, and I'll try and reproduce um, that 15-minute derivation uh, in under five minutes without going too fast. Okay, so um, we're going to start off with this trial solution, U, X, Y, Z. And um, I'll leave that constant out the front, and I'm going to put in a... Um, uh, 
what is it here? I need to get my working out from the other day. It's um, I outside of P of Z um, plus K on 2Q of Z. And then I had some quadratic terms in the position. And that looks pretty good. So um, the first thing I need to do is figure out the Laplace, the transverse Laplacian. That was the first term we calculated by hand, and it was pretty gruesome. Um, here, it's as easy as just taking the derivative of this function u of x, y, z with respect to x first. That's just what we did by hand. And it looks really nasty. Well, let's add that to the, um, the second order derivative with respect to y as well. That will give us the total transverse Laplacian. This is not looking good at all. So um, remember that we actually simplified this by dividing it through by some stuff. We looked for common terms and noticed that most of the time what we're doing here is differentiating into the exponent of, um, of this function. Um, so we're going to take out this common term of um, uh, 2 times i times k times uh, u of x, y, z. And this still looks um, ridiculous until we simplify it. And it's much, much simpler. This was the first term in our praxial equation, so let's call it praxial 1. Yeah, that's good. Um, the second term was a derivative with respect to z, so we'll call it praxial 2, because it was our term 2. It was the partial derivative of, of u uh, with respect to z once, so the first partial derivative with respect to u. And we times that by 2ik. That was the second term in the praxial equation. And just like we divided the first term by 2iku, let's do that for uh, this second term as well. Uh, and we'll add a simplify to that just for good measure to see if it helps us along. Not so much. The total praxial equation was then the sum of those two things, which were equal to zero. Uh, still not quite simple until we add another simplify, because some of these things might cancel with each other. And, yep, there's some terms there. The next step we did was we identified this as a polynomial in the transverse position coordinate, x squared plus y squared. Now, you've probably seen replacement rules all year in your computational physics workshops. Um, you've probably seen them replacing individual terms for more complicated things. We're going to do the reverse now. We're going to take just a pattern in this expression, x squared plus y squared, and just like we did in our heads and with our hands and in our hearts, we're going to replace it uh, with R squared. And this is totally fine. This is what mathematics is all about. It's about pattern matching and replacement. Mathematics is great at that. It identified where there was an X squared plus Y squared. It replaced it with an R squared. So now I've got a polynomial in R. So that's our paraxial equation. It's equal to zero. The way we made progress then was to look at the coefficients of this polynomial. Uh, in R. So we're going to make a coefficient list, if I can spell that correctly, of paraxial, and I've got to tell coefficient list something. First I've got to give it a polynomial, and then I've got to tell it what the variables are. So here the variable is R, and mathematical will go away and calculate three coefficients for me. It's already figured out that it's a quadratic, so it's got the, um, the constant term of the constant coefficient, the linear coefficient, which is zero, and the quadratic coefficient there. Now remember that what we did was we said that each of these things was equal to zero. That was how we made um, progress in getting these separate equations for P and Q. However, if I do this in Mathematica, I'll just get a list equals zero, which is clearly not that well defined, and Mathematica kind of scratches its head and, and leaves me there. What I need to do is I need to thread that equality through the list um, with the function thread, and it will make that equality um, get passed through each one of those elements um, the first one is equal to zero. The second one is just the comment zero equals zero, so it's trivially true. And the third one is equal to zero. And um, if we then just put these into a, um, uh, a simplify, we can probably recover uh, what we had at the end of our working out. And we're going to make the um, simplification based on two things. Q of Z is bigger than zero because that appears on the denominator, and K is bigger than zero. And if we put that in table form, stop your watches. There's our two equations. Um, how did I go? Four minutes 30. Four minutes 30. Cool. So 15 minutes, down to four minutes 30. 
the process was exactly the same. We broke up the equation into two steps. We calculated each one, divided through by uh, intuitive common factors, and then made some um, uh, coefficient substitutions based on the um, linear independence of this equation in R. And we get these two equations. One's really simple. It's for this complex radius of curvature evolving with Z. And the other one's got something to do with the mystery function P, which we're going to figure out what that is today. Um, but we end up with the exact same thing. Uh, very cool and much, much easier. So we ended up with these two equations. And um, before we ended up solving them, even though you can kind of solve this one in your sleep, we also wanted to remind ourselves how this parameter Q was actually connected to physical stuff, right? We premised the existence of Q on some radius of curvature of the beam, but we said it's a complex function. So we are allowed to parameterize its real and imaginary parts in some way that we like. And the way that uh, is going to make sense for us, uh, even though it might not be so obvious at first, is to write it in this way, to write the inverse of Q as um, a real part plus an imaginary part. And you can see that um, the reciprocal of uh, Q has a real part, which is the reciprocal of some uh, R of Z. That's going to be our real radius of curvature. And the real part is a function of um, W of Z. That will end up being our waste. And we'll see exactly how that works today. <clears throat> Before we go on and see how that works, if we literally just substitute it in, this expression into... Uh, the trial solution form, we already have a hint that what we've got is, uh, is going to work. Because um, just substituting in this parameterization of Q in terms of a real and imaginary component uh, tells us a lot about the beam. It tells us that there's um, some phase factor here. This is all uh, a complex phasor in the first expression, which has the familiar plane wave phase, the familiar spherical uh, phase in the praxial approximation, and some transverse amplitude profile. This is actually the decay of the amplitude in space, providing us with that uh, real-life beam that goes to zero at some sufficient distance away from the optical axis. But we still don't know exactly how um, uh, R of Z evolves, how W of Z evolves with Z, uh, and what this mystery P function is. So that's um, something we're going to have to do by hand. Uh, and now is a, as good a time as any uh, to that. So let's um, go to OneNote and, um, and have a go at actually doing one of these exercises from the notes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, this, this function here, literally just substituting in um, this parameterization of Q into the trial solution, uh, gives us this amplitude profile that pops out. And yep, it's a Gaussian function in the transverse position x squared plus y squared. So it's, it's not a, um, a complex phasor anymore. It's literally just a decaying amplitude that goes away to zero. So there's this exercise in the notes that, um, that tells us, now that we're armed with a differential equation for Q and, um, and this kind of parameterization of it in terms of a, um, a function R of Z and W of Z, Let's try and solve the equation for Q and then find out exactly how W of Z and R of Z change as the beam propagates. So let's um, first remind ourselves what the equation for Q looks like. It was Q prime of Z was equal to 1. Oh, so simple. This means that um, Q of Z is going to be equal to some constant, Q naught plus Z. And remember that Q0 can be complex because this function, um, Q of Z, is a complex function. <clears throat> but of course, uh, Z is, is real. We also want to um, use the ingredient uh, that 1 over Q is equal to 1 over R plus some complex component. And here, um, instead of using K, I've just substituted in what we know um, k to be, which um, uses the fact that k is just the wave number 2 pi over lambda. And um, 
we should also point out, because we're in this habit of um, reminding ourselves which things are real and which things are complex, that R of Z is a real number now. It's something that's a physical property of the beam. And so too is W of Z. These are the real observables that we're trying to, um, to figure out uh, how they evolve. So we should um, use the initial condition of this differential equation to, um, to get rid of some of these obscure constants. So the beam's going to be characterized beam bean by a waist, it sure is, um, which has a spot size of W naught. And um, that's what we're going to denote W at zero. And also a radius of curvature which diverges because at zero, this will become infinity, which is um, what we've kind of uh, sort of ascribed to this Gaussian beam at this focus. There's going to be planar wave fronts, albeit ones whose amplitude is um, decaying. Yeah. So like, why make that assumption? Yep, yep. good question. Um, there are several grounds to do it for the symmetry of the problem. We'll see that um, the curvature is going to change. The curvature is going to become positive as we move along Z and negative as we move along negative Z. And if we tried to make the like, location of that axis of symmetry away from the minimum radius of the beam, uh, the equations would not hold. Um, so for now, I will ask you to suspend your judgment and see how the result remains consistent, but you can certainly <laughs> check for yourself that if you didn't do this, uh, the solution would break. Yes? The minimum, radius is at the, waist. the minimum radius is at the waist. So when I say beam waist, I, what I literally mean is the point where W of Z reaches its extrema, reaches W naught. So this is all happening for us uh, at Z equals zero. And we get the above equation being um, 1 over Q naught is 1 over infinity. Yes, I'm going to get my math license taken away from me. Plus I lambda on pi W naught squared. And of course, uh, this term cancels out. And I'm left with uh, the solution to Q naught, which is the initial condition for Q. It's equal to... Um, negative i times pi w naught squared on lambda. This is a length. You can see it's got, um, it's a complex length. It's negative i times some uh, thing which has units of length. And this is the characteristic scale of the Gaussian beam evolution. Um, you've probably already done some, done some plug and chug with this. Um, this is negative i times zr, where um, zr is the Rayleigh range. So this is the first time we've seen, naturally, this ratio pop out of the equations, and it's going to turn out to be really useful to bundle this ratio up into a characteristic length. Uh, it also allows us to write the solution to Q of Z um, really simply now. So Q of Z, how does it evolve? Well, it's literally just Z minus I times ZR. So this is a really simple complex function. At the beam waist, at z equals zero, it's purely imaginary. And as we move away from z, it becomes, it, it gains a real part, but that complex, uh, the imaginary component stays constant. Yes? So here I, I had already solved q of z, but I had this um, kind of unknown constant q naught. This wasn't in terms of anything physical. We didn't know whether it was um, purely real or purely imaginary. Now we know that it's. Um, it is an imaginary number, negative i zr, and that zr is, is a characteristic length of the problem. So this is um, super useful because we've got this explicit form for the complex radius of curvature now in terms of physical properties of the beam. We're totally armed with all we need to figure out um, how the waste evolves with z and how the radius of curvature 
evolves with Z. So we're going to do one of these today. Let's, um, let's figure out the waste as a function of Z um, as this exercise demands of us. To do this, because we're working with the reciprocal of Q to get R, R, W and R, we need to know something about um, how to take um, the reciprocal of a complex number and find out it's real and imaginary components. So we're going to derive two simple identities um, because we need to find uh, one on R, which is the real part of one on Q of Z, or we might be interested in finding lambda on pi w z squared, which was the imaginary part of one on q of z. So this isn't a super trivial equation to solve because it looks like this. R of z is equal to uh, the real part of the inverse of q, all inversed, and w of z squared, we'll just leave it squared for now because it makes things easier. That's equal to the imaginary part of Q of Z to the power of minus one, also the power of minus one. So it looks perhaps innocuous, but it's actually, um, it uh, gives us a moment's pause and, um, and a persuasion to perhaps derive some useful identities. So those identities are um, going to be based on figuring out the inverse of a complex number and I'm going to define a complex number by um, its amplitude and its phase. So I'm just going to use the, um, the exponential form or the polar form where I parameterize um, a complex number A by its amplitude and its phase. And the first thing I'm going to figure out is, uh, well, what's the inverse of A? That's pretty easy. To figure out the inverse of A, I just take the inverse of the amplitude and I negate the phase. Uh, hopefully that's all fairly familiar to you. Actually, you know what? It's probably not, and it's not so much so familiar to me. So I'm going to do it in absolute gruesome detail. All right, explicitly inverting a. But then it's just a matter of using exponential laws. Uh, yeah, I do. I'm getting ahead of myself. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to explicitly put the phasor in terms of cos and sine now and write it as um, cosine of theta minus i sine theta. The reason I do this is because I can start identifying uh, these terms with the real and imaginary parts of A. So this straight away tells me that um, the real part of a to the minus 1 is equal to the inverse of a times the real part of a divided by its amplitude. That's what cos theta is. So what I end up getting here is the real part of A divided by its modulus squared. That's our first identity. That will be useful for figuring out the radius of curvature as a function of Z. The second identity this little bit of working out gives us is um, the imaginary part of the reciprocal of A. So it is equal to um, the modulus of A to the power of minus one uh, times minus the imaginary part of A on mod A. And again, that's, it's got something to do with um, the inverse squared of mod A, but this time we've got a minus sign out the front of the imaginary operand, operator. So these are our um, two quite useful identities. Um, if you're doing complex analysis this semester, that'll be pretty, um, pretty straightforward to you. And now we're ready to, um, to go straight ahead and um, put these into the expression and find out how the waste changes with Z. So from the previous page, 
we had Q of Z evolves very simply like this. And we had that the waist squared was equal to uh, lambda over pi times uh, the imaginary part of Q of Z to the minus one all to the minus one. All right, where should we go from here? Well, we're going to use this, um, this green identity to figure out what the imaginary part of, uh, imaginary part of Q of Z is. So um, this bit, I'll do it in green. And I'll raise it all to the power of minus one. Uh, it's going to be negative the imaginary part of Q. Remember that um, Q had this constant imaginary part of negative ZR, so that's just um, positive ZR. And I've got to divide by the modulus of Q all squared. Finding the modulus square of a complex number is super easy because I, I just take the square of the real part and add it to the square of the imaginary part. So that's going to be z squared plus uh, z r squared. And now all I'm left to do is to, um, to uh, simplify this. It's not looking so simple yet, but what I'm going to do is um, pull out a, uh, a common factor, a not so common factor of one on ZR. What I'd like is to have some parameterization where um, I'm looking at a ratio of Z with respect to ZR. Like, let's think about how we're actually going to make this a physical expression that's more useful to us. We know that ZR is a physical length scale of the problem. So we, we've got to try and put all of our lengths in terms of that length scale. Because then what, we'll, then what we'll have is a function of ratios of lengths, which is capturing the essential physics of the problem. So to get this in terms of a ratio of Z and ZR, I've got to do something a bit weird, uh, and that is multiply the top and uh, multiply this by one, of course, but a very special type of one. And uh, I'll get... And, uh, and by doing that, I'll have, um, hmm, is that actually what I wanted to do? I actually think the one that I want is just ZR on ZR. Yeah. And one of these ZRs is going to go in the bracket, and one of them is going to come out the front. Yes, this is good because then I'll have one plus Z on ZR all squared. Cool. Now it's worth doing a sanity check. Have I screwed this up? Well, I've got this nice dimensionless um, ratio of lengths here. So this whole term is going to be dimensionless. And the coefficient out the front, it's got dimensions of length squared. The left-hand side is, of course, W of Z squared. So yes, at least the dimensions of this are correct. Finally, we remember that um, we had this expression for ZR to start off with, which was pi w naught squared on lambda. That means that there's some redundancy in this front term. And when I substitute in what ZR is, uh, this just gives me w naught squared. And we end up with the final expression for w, sorry, w of z. So um, there was a bit of complex gymnastics here, but there was also something we do all the time in physics, which is to take this equation, which we could have just stopped at and said, you know, full marks, move on to the next question. 
and actually tried to put this in useful terms that give us a class of functions, a type of function which uh, tells us the essential dial of the equation and um, puts things into a, um, into a characteristic length scale of the problem. This is just one example. We could also have solved for, um, for the radius as a function of z as well. When we do that, we get these two functions. W of z, we call that the one on E radius of the transverse amplitude profile, and R of z, the radius of curvature of the wavefront. And this is what they look like. So we just derive this one. I'll leave this one for you to derive. Um, it is the exact same process, except you're using the other complex identity. But again, we've just done a lot of equation mashing. I don't want to leave you with this sense that um, it's all algebra. And uh, we did just figure out the essential dial of this equation. So let's actually play with the waste function and see um, if it truly does describe a Gaussian beam. Um, and even if it looks like something we might use for an optical tweezer. Yep. There we go. OK, so um, what we did was we had this, um, this function w of z. And uh, I'm going to uh, make up an example where we basically plot it for some particular numbers. Um, but I'm going to also start off with this very important function ZR, because it's, it's the characteristic workhorse of our, of our length scales here. Um, it depends on W0. Uh, it also depends on lambda. Here, I just want to kind of set lambda to be some um, constant number that uh, is you know, a number that I don't have to always put into the um, function call. I can do this with the um, colon equals notation in Mathematica. This means it's an optional argument. If you're used to Python, you'd call this a keyword argument. And um, hmm, I'm going to ignore that syntax highlighting for a second. And that's my expression for the Raleigh range. Why, why Mathematica? Ah. It's not colon equals, it's colon underscore. No, it's just colon. <laughs> I'm a bit rusty after the mid-semester break as well. OK, so this is our first function we're going to use. And again, wow. using any computer programming language is about taking simple functions and building them up into more complex functions. Um, now we're armed with a simple function we can use to build uh, the solution we just found. So um, this function w of z is going to depend on um, the position z, the waist size w naught, and the wavelength. Again, I'm going to specify it as a constant 1. And now I'm going to have it equaling w naught times the square root of 1 plus uh, z on zr w naught lambda. And I've got to square all this. And that looks pretty good. Make sure it looks pretty good by actually plotting it. So we're going to plot w of z uh, from Let's go from like negative 10 to 10. And we have to choose a particular waist size. Hmm, what should we choose our waist size to be? Let's choose the waist size to be 1 as well. And go from negative 10 to 10. So we'll go through like 10 waists. All right. That's looking sort of OK. Um, let's make this look more like a beam. So far, it just looks like some kind of hyperbola. Let's times the waist by um, plus or minus 1. That's better, because now I've got two kind of um, lines of constant amplitude showing me this kind of contour of the amplitude of the beam. It doesn't look much like a laser beam, though, does it? So let's change the plot style to red, because most laser beams are red, let's face it. And we're still stuck with these lines. We'd like to um, identify or acknowledge that the position between these lines is where the laser beam has its highest intensity. So let's go to um, the filling and make them go to the axis. OK, this is looking a lot cooler. But it's still a pretty static diagram, right? It's giving us this uh, much more accurate picture than what I drew, but it's something we haven't really got a feel for uh, how, what it depends on yet. So let's take a different example. Let's instead take this beam and squeeze the light down by a factor of two. So this time we're going to make um, the laser beam blue. It doesn't have a different wavelength. I'm just using this for um, kind of representative color. And something changed. It's not so easy to see what changed, though, because 
the axes of Mathematica kind of increased. So I need to plot these two things on top of each other. I can do that by assigning these two plots to variables, P1 and P2. And then I, I just use show P1 and P2 on top of each other. And you see straight away the physics of what's happening. So we started off with the red beam, which indeed expanded as we went away from the waste. The, the consequence of confining light is to make it spread out. This is true of all waves. But, but if you confine the waves more, they spread out faster. This is known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, um, also diffraction, also Fourier optics, and in our case, how Gaussian beams propagate. We're going to make this a bit more um, animated if you didn't already guess, though, and we're going to do so by turning this equation into a machine with a dial. So um, I'm going to take my code snippet above, and I'm going to stick a manipulate on it. What's the thing I'm going to use to um, manipulate this expression with, do you think? The waste, yeah. So let's make the waste be the dial of this equation. Whenever you're making um, an animation like this, you should also uh, restrict the axes bounds so that the whole plot this doesn't change um, as you uh, change the waste. I actually want to have like a physical picture of space that's just a, a constant um, field of view. Let's make this go from like minus 10 to 10 or something. And uh, now I've got my essential code snippet. I can wrap that in manipulate and make w naught uh, go from uh, I don't know, point 0.1 to, um, to 5. Okay. That, at the moment, isn't exactly what I want. Let's just make it be a slider instead. And we'll make it red again. All right. So we're starting off with a very skinny beam, and then as we allow it to expand in the middle, it doesn't expand so much in propagation. So by confining the light less, we are making a more collimated beam in the far field. Let's look at that for a better choice of vertical axis range. So this is the essential physics of, of a Gaussian beam propagating. It's also uh, the essential physics of really all wave propagation. The more you squeeze a wave, the faster it spreads out. That's at least how I'd explain it to a kindergarten student. We talked about... Um, characteristic length scales, though, and uh, I don't want you to get the false impression that the function is somehow changing. Yes, the beam truly physically changes in space, but it's still the same type of function. And there's a really nice way we can show that, which is to say, well, you know, which is the length scale of the problem that will um, be retained in the, uh, in the vertical axis? And instead of plotting this from some constant vertical range, I'm going to instead plot this across... Um, three Rayleigh ranges along each vertical direction. So if I instead now zoom out as I squeeze or contract the beam, I better make that actually a hmm, five, perhaps. Ah, that's not what I want at all. <laughs> Maybe I just need that to be uh, a number which is proportional to the waste. All right, so now when I press play, uh, something also failed. I wonder what's going on there. Hmm. Oh, I see. I'm changing the vertical axis, but I'm not changing the horizontal axis. I should be zooming out in both directions. So instead, what I'm going to do is, um, is scale the vertical axis by the number of wastes, but only go out three Rayleigh ranges. That would make sense. So I basically want to go out to as far as, um, as three times the characteristic length in each direction. And now I can choose an appropriate range for the vertical axis. And hopefully, everything stays the same, except for the numbers. So this is another way of looking at the same physics. And that is that, um, yeah, sure, the length scales are changing, but the actual function, it stays exactly the same. So once you've solved the propagation problem for one Gaussian beam, you've solved it for all of them. They all look the same, just with different contractions or expansions along each axis. <clears throat> Before we finish up today, I just want to point out what this um, magical function P is. <laughs> 
I won't solve it explicitly here, but um, if you looked at the notes, you'll see that it's actually quite, um, quite exotic. It contains our normalization constant, but it also contains this, um, this arctan phase. So it is useful for a couple of things. It normalizes the wave field in overall amplitude and acknowledges the fact that the peak intensity goes down as the beam spreads out. But it's also got this exotic thing called the Goy phase shift. It was discovered about 130 years ago by Goy by doing some cool interference. He showed that whenever you pass a beam through a focus, it picks up this phase shift. It's a consequence of confinement. It happens for all waves, including matter waves. We've measured it here at Monash using electron beams, uh, including um, works by uh, Tim Peterson and Michael Morgan. Um, and the reason I, I think of it is because when you compare a Gaussian beam to a spherical wave, one of them goes in both directions. Spherical waves go out from the middle and out from the middle that way. But a Gaussian beam is always going in one particular direction. And the only way you can have the wave fronts match up at infinity, plus or minus infinity, is if there is a pi phase shift somewhere in between. And that's exactly what happens um, with the Goy phase shift. So it's a small deviation of the wave fronts from spherical 